for so long people have treated climate change like it was something far away, but now with the wheat crisis, obviously it's affecting all of us on a personal level. If you haven't already been affected by the yearly fires in the West Coast, hurricanes in the East or near the, then you certainly are being affected by the wheat crisis in some way. Even though it's affecting all of us, the effects are not equal. It's just the latest of many climate disasters that we faced in the US and around the world because our leaders have continually prioritized profits over our planet. As I said last week, climate justice is racial justice. And today we're going to be talking about how climate crises are particularly affecting poor communities, which are disproportionately Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. And, you know, it's been a long fight to get as far as we've come with po um, climate policy because it took so long to get uh, the majority vote in the legislative branch that was needed to pass aggressive climate policies. We finally passed the Green New Deal after the war on climate was declared in 2026. But unfortunately, it wasn't early enough to, to mitigate these issues. Like, So here we are in 2032. You know, it's frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is when when we know that our government can take action, but it didn't and that it it, you know, made the issue even worse, you know, especially when the reason behind it is just greed and corruption and, you know, wanting to make more and more money. But at the end of the day, no matter how difficult it gets, we, we need to, to always stay uh, focused on action and, and not give up on hope. I'm very excited about more planet first policies and I hope that the momentum will keep going because we definitely need policies that make uh, lowering global emissions a more important metric than increasing the GDP and I'm hoping that more will be able to pass the true cost initiative so we start charging producers and consumers for the cost of the damage that these products cause and the natural resources they deplete instead of exploiting those resources and also human labor Although most of that may be robots now. We need Sage more in office. We need the planet first policy. We need somebody who is going to take bold measures in like into um, in caring for our climate and not only for the president, but keeping the majority in the legislative branch to make sure that these policies get passed instead of these two parties kind of just continuing to fight each other. And so just to move along, we already knew this, but the crisis has given a lot of examples of what I said last week, which was climate justice is racial justice. And one of those that we are seeing increasingly is uh, with the grocery drones. Generally, like before this crisis, they've been pretty great for food access, I would say. You know, there have been food swamps and food deserts, which are places that, uh, if you don't know, it's either like places where the food is only fast food or convenience stores and other unhealthy food or a place where food is just like not convenient to get like the nearest grocery store being, you know, miles and miles away. So the implementations of drones actually made it deliveries fast, cheap and healthy groceries became more widely accessible. But now that that system is under stress because of the wheat crisis, a lot of people have been struggling to get their groceries like fulfilled. And so this like weird pattern has emerged. So the algorithm that was that programmed the grocery drones it was prioritizing the trips that would maximize profit. So wealthier white suburban neighborhoods who were stocking up in large amounts and buying more expensive items were getting their orders first. I, to combat that, have been helping organize relief efforts here in Brooklyn. And we've realized that if we pool all of our orders together, we can kind of hack the system and get our delivery faster. This is actually working really well in Brooklyn, like in, in other cities, but I actually it makes me worried about rural areas that can't pool as easily. My family got displaced by some of the fires in California and, and moved in with a family member. And they live in a rural area where they just don't have access, um, the same access that I do. So Karen Anderson actually has responded with a statement. So we're going to play that now. Both Russia, Russia and, and China are top grain producers in the world. Instead of opening up their markets to us, they have decided to punish us and punish the world by siloing their supply to artificially raise prices. This is unacceptable. For decades, we partnered with these countries under a banner of free trade and international cooperation. For them to abandon us in this time of need is to attack our families, our neighbors, and our nation as a whole. We are prepared to take extraordinary steps to ensure the American people have access to our staple grains at affordable prices. To you, the American people, let us remember in this time of crisis 
that even on our worst days, we are blessed to live in America. Listening to her sometimes feels like traveling back in time. <laughs> it's just blame and fate and switch, blame and move on. Especially to like deflect responsibility and accountability for what the government could have done to mitigate the damage. I can't help but but think about this in response to what we shared last week with Sage Moore's response, where she was actually talking about how we need to care for the land and once again thinking about planet first and not placing blame on other countries, but understanding the necessity of accountability. And I just want to one more time be, uh, remind us that she is uh, running for president. And if you are registered to vote, you uh, should for her. Um, because I mean, yeah, this doesn't seem very progressive and, and I, I don't love <laughs> the president's response. I want less, you know, blame and more actual accountability. Yeah, it's amazing. Like in just the, the course of a few paragraphs, she managed to indoctrinate, berate, and beg all at the same time. <laughs> I mean, other countries are relying on us. So being antagonistic doesn't help anything. And, you know, the U.S. is the, the number two wheat exporter in the world. Like if they're saying, you know what, 60% of the crops are uh, the wheat store is going to be destroyed maybe more by the end of this. And if we export 50% of our normal amount, like that leaves us with less grain than what would typically be used domestically. Yeah, her response is really problematic for me for a lot of reasons. I feel like this is an opportunity, again, as we saw with the coffee being collapsed a few years ago, like not even that long ago, how can we change? What can we shift and pivot? Like, how can we minimize our consumption of wheat? How can we be held accountable for our commitments to the rest of you know our to other countries for what we're supposed to be providing and how can we continue to uphold our our end of the, arre the arrangement be, or the bargain? Um, because like those who are uh, financially secure can just continue with their um, AI personalized meal plan that's like yeah, already low in carbs. Uh, but especially with the struggle to find consistent work when jobs are constantly being automated, so many people simply cannot afford for there to be. Um, price gouging on the most basic staple ingredients. This is why we need climate reparations. The answer is not reparations. It's, it's foresight. It's foreseeing these things. We can't just give money out to people. That we have to, we have to figure out a way to innovate and survive this uh, and get through this crisis. But the answer is not handouts. It's not about handouts, you know, it's, it's about acknowledging that the actions of powerful companies and countries have profited uh, at the expense of people who are already struggling. You know, the, the U.S. is historically the largest emitter of CO2, and I think that they should take responsibility for that expense. There has been a series of lawsuits within the U.S. for national funds for climate, which could help pay for food programs here now. And then there's also been a demand for the U.S. to pay reparations on a global scale because of the role in climate. Yeah, plus the climate migration is a major issue right now. I'm a climate uh, refugee. I, I, I'm here in San Francisco now with a flooded home and farmland that's been decimated and destroyed by uh, recent hurricanes down there. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I think as a nation, we have to take care of our own people first. We have issues here domestically before we start sending uh, money across the globe for, for, frankly, issues that cannot be necessarily directly traced to us. My family was also displaced. You know, I, I want to ask you, you know, in the response of you having to move, what, what happened? My family had to sleep. I was here, but they had to sleep in a gym for a week before we could figure out how we could move for a little bit. So, you know, it's a little, I just wonder the difference and I understand the climate migration and the necessity for reparations maybe at a different level because like I said, climate justice, racial justice, and my family was, you know, a little bit less fortunate than it seems like you were in this movement. It's important to acknowledge and understand when people are in a more privileged position. I think being a climate refugee is a very different experience for somebody that has to sleep in a gym for a week and has no home at all. And somebody that can just relocate to one of the most expensive cities in the U.S. 
easily. So, I mean, that's just worth noting, right? Like, I think it's just worth being aware of that. Like, it's a horrible, it seems horrible, awful experience. And I don't wish it on anybody, but it is probably nice to know that you have some kind of nest to fall into or fall back on. If you want to go and measure levels of inconvenience, I mean, you know, we could, there's different ways to measure it. I didn't sleep in any gym, but I don't think that you're, I don't think that your family's, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't want to necessarily make this personal, but I don't know if your family's displacement costs them tens and close to hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, if you want to, if you want to talk about, if you want to put a, a price tag on it, we live in a capitalist economy and, you know, I, I, but I'm not here. You, you want to hear my ex- experience? I'm sharing my experience. I, I think we're just asking you to have a more comprehensive understanding of the systems that are in play, right? You have benefited from a certain amount of them. Especially if you're struggling with no countries wanting to th- take you in, even if those countries have caused the most kind of damage. If someone's home is like flooded or or burning, like, would you just like look at them and be like, oh, sorry, your problem, I'm just gonna keep going with my life, or would you invite them? I'll take that same analogy and, and I'll put to you, if, if, if it's someone in your family whose house is burned down versus somebody that lives in the next town over, who are you gonna prioritize? What I'm saying is people here in this country need to take care of their own before they we open up the borders and, and, and let people in. What if we're talking about you right now? What if the script was flipped and this was us saying this about, well, you're, you know, you're that neighbor over there, so you can't come in. Like, I feel like it's easy to not take responsibility for any of this when it's not you. You even have firsthand experience with being a climate refugee, you know, like you had to move, right? So. That was a bummer for you. We're just asking you to have a a broader scope of what this is like for people and why the initial like attack on the idea of reparations is not helpful to anyone. Like it's like spoken like a true nationalist, you know, like it's that's it's our selfishness that has gotten us in this position in the first place. I disagree that it's our selfishness. Well, what's wrong with being a nationalist? I mean, you know, I I recognize that I am from a fortunate family. And that's because of this nation. You know, we had, my, you know, thanks to the, the Homestead Act, we were able to develop and slowly from a family of immigrants four generations ago. You just said like a family of immigrants, right? Like, so that's how it all started for you. Everybody, everybody here mm-hmm. knows that, right? Like, so mm-hmm. this idea that all of a sudden fast forward 150 years or however long, whatever your family has been here, or whoever's family has been here, the rules should change completely. And we should not mm. be thinking of ourselves as global citizens. Like, how does that make any sense? Hey, y'all, Baven, Ben, Sada, we are reaching a point in which we are not being trauma informed or, you know, understanding of each other's values. I just want to remind everyone what we're here to do. I understand that things got a little bit tense just now, and I totally understand why. And I want us to continue to have this conversation, but only if we respect each other and are actually coming from, you know, a place of being wanting to understand, right? You are, we are all here because we believe in people's capacity for transformation and we understand that other people come from different perspectives. So once again, there's no attacking. We wanna be able to call in and not call out because every moment can be a learning moment. And if we're going to be global citizens, if we're going to be understanding about taking responsibility for damage that has that we have caused, you know, we just need to be more understanding in our conversation. This kind of division that is happening in this own space is not going to help us progress forward.